I want to preface this by saying that maybe, just maybe, what I'm about to say is partially my fault. I hyped this cooler up just a little bit too much in my head and when it came in, well, that expectation wasn't met. With that said though, guys, look at this. They're not even spinning up. It's as if they're not even plugged in, but I can assure you that they are, as you can see right here. You want to know what's the strange thing though? When I rotate the AIO like this, they come back on. And this has been a real problem for me because even when they do come back on, they seem to be running below speed and I've even gotten BIOS post code errors saying that my fans are either not plugged in or running too slowly. The thing is that I found out about this problem after I mounted this cooler on my case. And you know what? I think that I know exactly why it's failing. So yeah, this has honestly never happened to me before, to any of the AIOs that I've owned before. And this is the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 240. I think it's quite clear that the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 that I got is defective. When I first found out about this, I tried to get in contact with Arctic support staff and all they could do was acknowledge that it, of course, was defective and that I should return it to where I bought it from and get a replacement. So normally this wouldn't really be a problem, but in this case it kinda was because you see, I bought this cooler off Amazon and I shipped it to Malaysia via a freight folder because it's not sold locally here, so returning it would be a major hassle to put things lightly and that would end up costing me more than the cooler itself so it really wasn't going to be an option for me. Still, I did want to do this review so what I thought I would do instead was to identify where and what exactly was failing on this cooler and try to circumvent or avoid it and try to get in uh, sorry, <laughs> and try to get an accurate a benchmark as possible of this cooler without the fault. The point of failure in this case I think should be pretty obvious, right? It's the fan's power cables that run through the length of the tubes. So to work around this issue, what I did was to use a fan splitter to directly connect the fans on the radiator instead to the motherboard to skip the wires in the tube entirely. So I tested this solution and I've tested that it works fine, so I went ahead with benchmarking this cooler on my Ryzen 7 3700X system. This is Before I move on to the results though, I just want to say that this has pretty much been the worst experience that I've had with getting a liquid cooler installed on the AM4 socket. This is because regardless of whether you're installing it onto a case standing up or lying down, the mounting system requires that you hold onto the AM4 backplate on the rear to prevent it from falling down and out when you're securing the pump blocker to the board because when you're tightening those four screws, it is just so extremely easy to just push out the backplate through the holes of the motherboard. Now, at the same time, I had to try and make sure that I was threading in the four screws in evenly as uneven mounting can cause higher temperatures due to the lopsided distribution that causes insufficient coverage of the thermal paste between the IHS and the cold plate. To add insult to injury, of course, due to the mounting system design and the size of the block, it is really not that easy reaching for the bottom two screws of the pump block. So yeah. Imagine trying to juggle all of this with one hand screwing the block in and with the other trying to hold the back plate securely in place. It is seriously not fun. Moving on to the test results, given how much good things I've heard about this cooler, you know what, I've, I had high expectations of it. What I didn't expect to find was it losing out in thermal performance. And yes, you know, I bring this up a lot, you know, but to my Segotep BQ240, which is a much cheaper Chinese-made AIO with a thinner radiator. Now, to verify this, I double-checked and I even triple-checked the numbers to, you know, make sure that I wasn't wrong and I even reseated the cooler a number of times to make sure that proper contact was made with the IHS, but the results still ended up roughly being the same. To be fair, of course, 
one Celsius of a difference isn't really something I would call a loss as much as it is a minor variance, but it's still not something I expected out of this cooler. You know, at this point, I guess given the faulty fan connectors and the difficulties installing the pump block, I was thoroughly expecting the results to be worthwhile, but unfortunately to quote Thanos, reality is often disappointing. That said though, if there's one department where it ironically lost, but also won over, it would be the fans. I found them to be exceedingly quiet actually, even at full speed, while being able to push a good deal of air through. So that was actually quite pleasantly surprising, and you know what? I actually do like these fans. Feelings aside, of course, I can't help but think that this cooler would have probably been a really good option for performance were it not for its flaws, so of course I decided to investigate into it further. Inspecting the braided tubes, the first thing that caught my eye, or rather actually my touch, was a few protruding bits of the, on the tube itself that were almost sharp and sticking out of the braiding. Now, I took a closer look at this and I realized that it was actually exposed wiring from the fan's cables that somehow broke not just through the insulation, but through the braiding as well. As I mentioned before, you know, through the length of the tubes, there were other points along the tube which exhibited this same anomaly as well. So what is most likely happening here is that unlike the rubber tubes and fabrics in the uh, braiding that can easily flex and stretch, the metal wiring for the fans cannot. And because uh, the pass-through was designed with not enough tolerance to accommodate for this flexing of the tubes, as soon as you start flexing the tubes at a more aggressive bend, and I can actually feel it right here, because of the tension of the wires, it rips off the solder joints where they're secured onto, and then the tubes return to, when, you know, when the tubes return to a more neutral position, these wires will want to kind of move back, but they can't if, let's say, they're stuck somewhere, or, you know, something is blocking it, or whatever, so it finds another way to do it, in this case, through the insulation, and even out of the tubes braiding okay now i'm not much of an expert when it comes to fixing these kinds of things but i feel that this issue could have been mitigated by designing more uh, i mean maybe slacken the cables to allow it to stretch and return along the length of the tubes it would have prevented the wiring from may ripping at the joints maybe <sighs> still it is what it is, and so when I try to install this onto my case that has a side-mounted radiator, the bending of the tubes to mount it in that position caused the wires, <coughs> the wires to rip off. Because of that, I would be very cautious about purchasing and installing this cooler in cases that have the uh, same kind of side-mounted radiator setup like that of the Lanley O11 Dynamic. In fact, short of installing it onto the front of the case, which I'm pretty sure is not 100% safe as well, I would be very cautious about installing this cooler on the top or bottom radiator spots of your case, as the kind of bends of the tubes might just actually be enough to cause damage to the wires within. It's a shame though, because I really like this cooler and idea behind it. It's just the uh, flawed implementation that just kind of makes me sad about it. Issues aside, I do like how it has a little fan on the pump block to help with the cooling of the VRMs, MOSFETs, and pretty much all of the other components around it. Though I couldn't really feel any appreciable amount of air coming off it, so I do wonder if it does anything noticeable. Still, of course, if it does work, it could be good for boards that could benefit from that extra airflow over the power delivery like my ASUS Strix B450F. I also like how despite not working properly, getting the cooler installed only needed plugging a single 4-pin fan header in, which simplifies the process significantly. The reality however is that until they manage to find a way to rectify uh, this issue, I find the design of the cooler to be just a little bit too fragile for me to recommend. And so even if it does perform really well on a good day, you may just remove the cooler one day to do some spring cleaning or just push it and twist it in 
some kind of different way while installing it again and all it takes is that one wrong bend more than it's willing to do and you have an AIO with a non-working radiator fan setup and that is a massive problem. I hope Arctic sees this video and maybe has a way on how to fix it or prevent this issue but in the meantime if you own this cooler and are experiencing weird issues like what I have here I would suggest contacting Arctic or the retailer in which you bought it from and getting it exchanged. If you however are looking for a cooler and you happen to stumble upon this video upon looking up the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2, then I would highly recommend instead looking for something else like maybe one of the coolers from NZXT or you know Cooler Master or maybe even Deepcool as they make pretty solid CLCs I've heard, I've not tested them. If you're in Asia though, or you have access to purchasing Segotep coolers, then I can highly recommend the Segotep Biku 240. With that said though, I think that should really conclude this video. It's just a bit disappointing, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a disappointing one, what I'm trying to say. But I suppose that not everything has to go right all the time, so yeah. If you like this video, then well, give it a like. Consider sharing it to share the little bit of a maybe awareness on this cooler or if you think that I'm doing something wrong and that maybe this is more of a user fault than um, a design fault, then maybe you can drop a comment or a suggestion down below. Don't forget to get subscribed and notified for any of my new videos and yeah, my name is Yang, the Tech Roden. Thanks a ton for watching and I guess I'll see you guys in the next video.